Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last of your your host, Mr. Liberal Democracy Lover. Right now, we got to talk about our simple policy. John Glenn stood in the Oval Office, longingly gazing out at the clear blue skies beyond the thin pane of glass before him when a knock came at the door. Come on in, the President said. Two men in gray suits stepped inside the oblong room. Do Clark, Clifford, Secretary of Defense, and Glenn Seaborg, Atomic Energy Commissioner. Gentlemen, said Glenn, what can I do for you today? Seaborg spoke first. We want to see you in person, Mr. President. We believe it's best this meeting takes place behind closed doors. Clifford says, when you first became POTUS, you gave us a simple policy for our nuclear arsenal. Keep expanding it, keep buying the world supply of uranium, and keep sabotaging the Germans and Japanese arsenals. And the President scratched his chin, and... And a uranium purchasing plan, while extraordinarily expensive, is going along smoothly, said Seaborg, placing a manila folder on the president's desk. We just won't be able to hide it forever. Glenn sat down at his desk. Extremely expensive plans are most certainly being discovered. A slight chance of nuclear annihilation. What are we waiting for? Oh, political power that we don't need. Also, um, so, as you can see here, we have just finished up Diana Project 3, which we had a 67% chance of succeeding and basically a 33% chance of failing. But we got it done successfully. Diana 3 is complete right now. Well, that's actually really cool. I, was, I risked it there. I risked it. I'm like, 67%. That's not bad odds. Still not good odds, but 45% liberal democracy, which I think went down a little bit. 45%. We do click on this. We have... We got 40 more political power, which is very cool. And now we're up to 46% party popularity, which is really nice. So, well, I think at this point, we should be done with Diana. And now we can do Glenn's Nuclear Commission. The Nuclear Commission has been assembled by President Glenn with the purpose of ensuring American strategic dominance over our global rivals. Only from a position of strength, gaming force, or geopolitical opponents who come to the table will go from passive deterrence to actively weakening the nuclear capabilities to our enemies, of our enemies. By expanding our nuclear arsenal and sabotaging those of Japan and Germany, we can ensure the primacy of American civilization. The commission we have uh, the commission has several proposals ready. Purchase Australian uranium. Why not? Oh, oh I guess we only do one at a time, huh? So we get some from Australia, South Africa, and Canada, which would be very, very good. A score settled around all around the world. Millions of TVs and radios of all make and model are tuned into the same broadcast. Each screen shows NASA's control center just minutes after Armistice has confirmed touchdown. There is some small chat between Aldrin, Michael, and Michigan controls that go through system checks. The whole world watches with bated breath for the long-awaited American response to the German moon landing. Finally, after what feels like a lifetime of waiting, they see it. Live footage from over 200,000 miles away starts all broadcasting. Filmed from the base of the armistice, the lunar surface stands outstretched behind the lander. A gray blemish landscape leading into the horizon, a lone figure emerges and descends the module. Michael Collins, first American on the moon, steps onto the fine gravel and makes his proclamation. With this first step, America's finally shooting her place among the stars. The news of Diana 3's success has left the public ecstatic. Even Glenn's harshest critics within the Senate remain silent in the face of America's victory. After some earned celebration, President Glenn prepares to address the nation in a televised speech from the front of the White House lawn. Today, I address not only our own citizens, but the world. After years of effort, we finally brought Americans to the moon. This represents years of hard work from our talent and team at NASA. None of this could have been possible without our engineers, astrophysicists, and countless other visionaries. No longer will we be bound by the failures of our Apollo program as we now remain tied with this, within this great race. Finally, I want to reiterate to everyone listening that this marks not the end in our long journey to the stars. No, this is only the beginning in which we get more political power every single day, stability works more, and we grow a little bit more unified. How much is this going to cost? What the heck do these plants run on? Are you burning hundred dollar bills? Would you make all these handles out of gold? Why the heck are these nuclear reactors so darn expensive? The Democrat Senator bellowed, face red from anger. They're so darn expensive because they are, President Glenn replied, maintaining his ice cold nerves. Turns out flying fighter jets and going to space have done a lot to make them calm and collected in the everyday life, or when your president facing off a bunch of Democrats live it over the cost of the National Nuclear Commission. If we don't spend the money to make them safe and stable, we will have to spend more down the line to repair them or worse. The darn nuclear program is blowing a hole in the budget, another senator said. We can't constantly keep borrowing money for all these pie-in-the-sky projects of yours, Mr. President. These nuclear plants will more than pay for themselves over the lifetime. 30, 40 years, Glenn replied. Lower power costs, less pollution, healthier people. We don't have to pay for Arabian or Persian oil, and the army's going to be stronger, and therefore America's going to be stronger for it. That's all well and good, Mr. President, the second senator said, but we have to worry about the money, and now we're going to have to borrow more, piling on more debt to pay for all these plants. That's going to be on our children and grandchildren to pay, so we all... So all so we can have some fancy power plants now. The president took a deep breath. I understand your concerns, gentlemen, and I keep them in mind. Thank you for your concerns. Democrats sinners glanced at each other and began to file out of the Oval Office. Sure, President Glenn heard them, but was he actually listening? The future will be poor, but they all have fancy nuclear reactors. Why, why does this even... This should happen. Like, I get it. Things are expensive, but... We have no debt. We literally don't have any debt. We still have a surplus every year. We are, God, it's not growing, but... We have no debt. Like, that should not fire if it's, you know... If we're not in debt. And we're not adding to the debt at all either. 
but not in my backyard. The National Nuclear Commission determined what the, that the best places to build nuclear power plants in, are in areas of small towns far away on the edge of major cities. The land is cheaper and easier to access and provide new jobs in the area than Edom, but those underdeveloped areas also have to be close to the iconic small towns of middle America and the sprawling suburbs that have re redefined American life since the end of the war where a lot of well-educated white middle-class Americans live. And many of those in small towns in suburbia across the U.S. are not really liking the fact that they are now going to be living next to a giant concrete monstrosity of cooling towers and giant reactors. The concerns are varied. The ugly buildings, lower land values, the threat of radiation, the risk of melting down, the dangers of nuclear waste, blocking further development. The fact that there is development and then just a loud noise of the construction tactics to oppose the construction of new reactors are also innumerable. Protests at country town meetings, pickets at construction sites, vandalism of machinery, letters and newspapers, calls for action from the state representatives or local congressmen. The opposition of the NNC is coalescing into the new movement that has been called Not In My Backyard or NIMBY or NIMBY. While much of the new NIMBY movement is grassroots and local, there have been many rumors about outside groups providing funds and supporting these groups. Investigations by media outlets have traced the funding through a myriad of people and shell companies. And eventually through... Uh, to the source, America's big oil and gas companies, but these discoveries are often buried and resulting in reporters reassigned or fired haven't dampened the movement at all. They are cave people, citizens against virtually everything, which, heck with that, build one in my town, that'll bring a lot of jobs and wealth to the city, or town, wherever I live, I don't know where I live, bring it, bring it over here, seriously, bring it over here. Corner of the market, though. Forcing the rival superpowers out of the nuclear business can't simply be done by restricting access to uranium alone. The myriad machines and intermediate inputs necessary to build both nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons are often commercially available. Crisscrossing the world through the arteries of global trade on a daily basis. Cornering the market for these components will not only weaken our enemies, but serve to empower ourselves if we can afford it. Which we can. Obviously we can. Obviously, obviously, obviously. Alright, what is up next? More ship stuff? Because we can. Uh, we're going to need more budget here. Um, joy testing, that's fine. Use public support, yes sir. More money too. Because now we're doing the Ares program, we need to do this four times, which is kind of ridiculous, but makes sense, I guess. As we're buying South African uranium, so. The glowing star of Chicago. Rockefeller and Metzenbaum sat across President Glenn as they all stared intently at the TV sets built in the Oval Office. The screen displayed images of a massive group gathered in front of the Dresden Generating Station, cheering, chanting, and waving banners in support of the nuclear power plant's success. The TV sets suddenly clicked off with the President's remote. The President sat silent, gazing at the TV sets before returning to meet the eyes of his staff. Metzenbaum and Rockefeller both felt uneasy at the President's reaction to the uplifting news of the TV program, as he seemingly seemed dreaded, dreadfully upset by the news. Mr. President, is everything all right? Metzenbaum finally chimed in, breaking the silence of the room. Immediately, the President barked back at the man, and both of you follow me now. The two men quickly followed Glenn, awaiting the news that could possibly have the typically gleeful President so perturbed after the great news. Finally, the President escorted the man to an inconspicuous car, making for the driver's seat, and hurting hurtling off into the Maryland evening. The car ride was silent. Finally, Glenn parked on a hill, shrouded in darkness, but offered a small, beautiful look over the White House and several beautiful sights of the D.C. area. Get out, the President commanded. The two men did so as Glenn walked them out to the trunk. The President lifted the trunk door where the two men saw an ice chest, which the President took hold of up and turned to the men. My one regret, the President said, is that I couldn't share a beer with the two men who made this all possible. Flight training made alcohol taste terrible for me. The two men looked shocked, disturbed, and honestly fearful as Glenn's stern expression melted into a warm smile and into a roaring laugh. As the men joined in by grabbing their beers and cheering the night away with a beautiful starry sky above an incredible nation before them. Thank you both for everything. Ooh, GDP growth will increase by 1%. Now that's what we like to see. Recruiting Disney? Ooh. Ooh, I think... Ooh, I remember which one we have to do on. Let's do that one. Recruiting Disney. As much as we've tried to boil down the science of nuclear power for the average citizen, there are bottlenecks. Most Americans don't reach Scientific American, and many viewers yawn and change a channel when faced by an egghead on TV. Selling a government project to the people has always been as much about familiar images and relatability as it has been about the actual facts at hand, or who and who or what is more familiar and relatable to the average American than Mickey Mouse. Mickey, Mickey, Mickey Mouse. We're gonna need more money, too. 16 days left, not bad. Intelligence analysis, because we can. Nuke purchase. Oh, did this go up? We are free to interfere in other. We are free to interfere in other countries' nuclear supply. Aw, oh, heck yeah! How are we doing here? <gasps> One point six percent growth. Nice. We still have a surplus. Oh, I love it. Oh, the economy. Slightly more inflation, but who cares? Who cares about the inflation rate when we have a growing economy, even better than before? A little bit of lag, but that's all right. Come on, I want to invest in areas. Actually, I want to see what, what percentage we're at to begin with. We're running out of research stuff. Like, really, really, last, blah, blah, blah. like I said in the last episode, there's not much we're going to do with the research points now, so. We have $459 billion in GDP. This is better than uh, when I did Glenn before Toolbox 3, when it, like, basically TNO came out. I had so much debt. I had so much debt when I first played as Glenn that it, it broke the game counter and actually made it into like a surplus, which is really kind of cool. 57% is not too bad, actually. 10, 15. Uh, let's go with 15 to start. Why not? Or we can just risk it right now. 
We could try that, but eh, we'll wait a little bit. 1.68. Oh, yeah. Go up, boys. Go up. Corner of the market, my friends. And Mickey, Mickey Mouse is next. Ooh. Nice. We're done with all that stuff, too. Good, good, good. Artillery that we're not going to use. Civilian opposition to the National Nuclear Commission. When the National Nuclear Commission was first proposed by President Jean Goulin, the idea was that it would balance both military and, of course, civilian needs. After all, the armed forces needs powerful weapons to protect America from similarly armed powers and chief atomic power to wean America off of foreign oil supplies and boost the, provide a boost to the economy in general, a win-win for, of course, everybody. However, it's becoming clear that most of the money earmarked for the NNC is being spent on the military with the vast amounts of money being spent on modernizing older weapons, designing new bombs, and deploying more missiles, building more bombers, laying down new subs. However, ordinary citizens, taxpayers, are seeing the NNC as not as great economic panacea that would lower power bills and the end the need for polluting power plants, burning oil, and coal. Complaints ranging from letters to the editor in the ed newspapers across America to overloaded switchboards in the capital are increasing by the day. Polls already shown that more and more people are turning against the NNC, unfortunately. Alienating ordinary citizens and taxpayers on what is already proving to be an expensive and controversial program is a Really bad news. The presidents of opponents in Congress and the media are already clamoring to scale back the Na National Nuclear Commission, reprioritizing its objectives or even scrapping it altogether. President Glenn's going to have to fix this, and sooner or else one of his greatest projects will fail. Or it will at least fall apart. It went down by 6%. I'm not concerned. Top Secret Operation Glowing Dragon to be presented at JCS and POTUS. Operation Glowing Dragon, the current plan is to seize control of the uranium resources in Africa, has been greenlit. As present time, there are two possible methods for operations execution. One, a small semi covert force would give the U.S. military plausible deniability. Troops involved with this would be mostly drawn from special forces, operations, and elite units. These soldiers would not fly American colors, nor would they use standard American issue weapons. They could seize, uh, would seize, large uranium deposits under the guise of a mercenary force, set up extraction and exportation, and send the materials back to the U.S. But, should our involvement be revealed to the public, it would likely become a scandal of untold proportions, thus, this is not recommended. Two, an official American intervention in Africa. Under the guise of restoring law and order to the former OFN protectorates, this action, while controversial first, is likely to be more beneficial in the long run due to the reduced need for intermediaries and secrecy. Uh, from General Norman Schwarzkopf, United States Af uh, Africa Command. Oh, Schwarzkopf was there in the 70s, huh? Keep this quiet. So, we're bringing the heavy artillery. Mm. South Africa, huh? Oh. Mm. I don't want to hurt liberal democracy, so. Our yield must grow. And denial of the enemy is not enough to win the war. Our own advancement of nuclear science is must match and overpass that of Germany and Japan if we mean to conclusively overpower them in nuclear armaments. The development of ever stronger nuclear weapons demands ever larger investments in our scientific and industrial bases. A price well worth paying. As long as we can keep our relations with the American public high, which we have already. We have 2.160 million mil millions. Oh, sabotage Chinese mines. We'll have to act inside their backyard. Ooh, help decrease Japan's nuclear stuff by a substantial amount. Well, let's purchase Australian uranium first. False flags? Oh my god, false flags on a nuclear power. That is... That is scary. Because <sighs> if we get caught, that wouldn't be very good. Actually, that should be a CIA mission. Yeah, it's not down here. Hawaiian Freedom... Well, we have... Oh, why do we have that? We already have them with us. Operation Glowing Dragon after action report. Excellent. Nice. Over the course of the past several weeks, American forces, covert and otherwise, have entered the jungles of the Congo Basin and seized several areas that are known to have uranium deposits as well as other valuable minerals and resources due to excessive use of helicopters and reconnaissance aircraft. Most high value targets were seized within a day. More fortified remote areas fell within a week. At the present time, the United States wielded strong control over the Shinkolobwe, also called the Hermansville Mine, as well as a looser hold upon the surrounding Katanga region. Resource extraction is currently being initiated, and rail lines to South Africa are being set up so that the resources may be exported back to the U.S. Forces of the 1st Marine Division, the 101st Airborne Division, attacked the mine as the first major target in the region, coming under fire from what was later confirmed to be the soldiers of the German SS, presumably left over from the fall of the Reichskommissariats in Africa. Some of officers have conjectured that the Germans are exporting uranium from the mine back to Europe, but the most experts of the USA. Africom, U.S. AFRICOM disagree. The Germans were put under heavy fire by Marines arriving in gunboats while airborne flanked using helicopters, leading to many of the remaining Germans being killed or fleeing as far as the currently known. Casualties from this initial strike numbered 40 Americans killed or wounded with over 330, 300 Germans killed. Wow. Following the success of the attack on Chicoloboy, the Marines spread out throughout the jungle in pursuit of the retreating SS elements, including meeting none. Meanwhile, the 101st, assisted by the U.S. Navy reconnaissance jets, attacked several surrounding villages and towns, most notably Likasi, also known as Jadlostadt, in the following week, American forces encountered minimal resistance from local warlord groups and German remnants, with total casualties at this time amount to 104 Americans wounded, 27 killed. Warlord and German casualties are unknown, but presumed to be significantly higher. Thank you, General Norman Schwarzkopf. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and then we'll do 
Our yield must grow. We control the power, pretty much. 15 billion, not bad still. Can we invest this yet? Nope, darn it. Yeah, not bad. Keep it higher, keep it higher, keep going up. Because we're building, building, building. Five days left. I might just risk it early. Ooh, upgrade to the... Oh, but we don't... Yeah, that's glitched. That's definitely glitched. Yeah, I'll have to use consequence for that, maybe. Or we just risk it right now. You know what? 70%. This is probably going to go very, very poorly for us. But we could try it. Big risk, no reward. Actually, big risk. We screw it up, and we get penalized very hard. Death. Okay, 72% is good enough for us. Great. Liberal democracy is currently at what? 44%? 44 and a half. All right, three more times then. Operation Resurgent Flame after action of Porter Bridge. Yesterday, they have heavily anticipated counterattack against the German and African warlords that nearly forced American forces to abandon the Katanga re region. American forces reclaimed the town of Lakasi as well as the vital mine of Shinakolobwa. Involved units include a majority of the forces of the 1st Marine Division, supported by elements of the 101st Airborne and the air wings of the U.S. Navy, 6th Fleet. The attack utterly shattered the thin alliance between the warlords, revolutionaries, and SS forces under Heinz Barth, sending them retreating back into the jungles with significant casualties. The attack was centered around the village of Panda, just to the south of Lakasi, where American close air support drew SS units out of their entrenched positions with the use of napalm and white phosphorus munitions. Once drawn out, helicopter elements of the 101st Airborne surrounded and destroyed the fleeing German units. Then they cleared the way for the several brigades of the 1st Marine Division to cross the Panda River and march on Lakasi from the south and southwest. Meanwhile, the remainder of the uh, 24th Battalion, 4th Marine, supported by the reinforcements of the 1st Battalion and close air support, advanced on Lakasi from the east. The Africans, likely seen the destruction wrecked upon the SS, broke formation and retreated to the north only after a few minutes of combat. Despite this temporary setback, it appears that much of the imported mining equipment is still intact. After ex executing a few search and s destroy missions to hunt down the last of the SS that escaped the bombings of Panda, the mine should be ready to export the uranium resources back to the US. <sighs> Run, you dudes, Uncle Sam's coming knocking. So we have one down for Ares. And I'm going to write that down so I don't forget. We control the power. There are those who say that the value of a nuclear arsenal of a nation's deterrent starts and ends with its mere existence. By simply retaining the ability to vaporize the world a hundred times over with the press of a button, President Glenn disagrees. The atom is not like a god, terrible and vengeful. It is a tool. A tool has many uses. If we only would employ it as such as uh, in our negotiations with Germany and Japan, the appeal of the atom. Nuclear is a dirty word in American politics. The average American is completely uneducated on scientific matters, and this particular one casts a dark shadow on our politics. Uh, the atomic attack on Pearl Harbor and the tensions surrounding the Hawaiian Missile Crisis have left our population fearful of anything radioactive and is abundantly clear that doubling down on a nuclear program is political suicide in the current climate. Fortunately, the evidence is on our side and we have the means to show it off to the public. One of our advisors has been in talks with Walt Disney Company to start creating some informational materials to make sure that people are being told the truth. We'll keep our own scientific, uh, uh, scientists and public relations officials involved to keep everything as accurate and educational as possible and make something that Americans of all ages will understand. The first decision we need to focus on is... or figure out what we're going to focus on. Do we target the Hawks and try to focus on our nuclear stock power? Do we discuss the potential of nuclear power? Well, uh, last time I did this, I remember I did nuclear energy is way of the future, but you want to do deterrence as a first line of defense. You want to do that one. Yeah, we control the power. Now, I could max out the nuclear arsenal, but that would cost an extreme amount, and I don't want to cost... Oh my god, 33 billion. Oh, no tasks. Okay, I'm like, wow. Even more growth. More growth. Grow. We're growers, not showers. Mission rewards. Nice. 92. What are we going to do to the research points? And 20, 20 more public support. Wow. Nice. Which means we're going to invest and have joint testing programs. Aries again. Directing the directors. But you see, Mr. President, that is precisely what we need in order to accomplish what you're looking for, you see. A big name is not what we need, uh, sir. The, uh... Big effect is what we need, sir, claimed the director Nathan Juron, as President Glenn sat behind his desk trying to struggle and listening to the mannerisms backing the foreign director's speech. Well, if Disney's big budget, use me and we can make the uh, movie magic, says Juron. No, 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 I'm sorry, Mr. President, but Mr. Juron is here thinking only on the artistic side of things, and quite frankly, if you see, seek to see this film succeed, there's going to be a lot more back in this movie than some effed up visual, sir, said the other man sitting across from the president, a certain Stanley Kubrick. As the two directors continued to argue back and forth, President Glenn sat further and further back in the already comfortable chair he had to sit in, day in, day out. 
Gone were the days of committing to executive and deci decisive military decisions on behalf of the U.S. armed forces. No, 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 no. Now all Glenn had to do was pick between these two idiots on who to run the nuclear movie to help win America over. On one side, we have Jerome, not, well, not really heavily regarded for the plot of his movies. Do we really need that when we were focusing on scaring the American public into realizing that we need nuclear missiles? Man could think of horrible, horrific images to make for a film that even Glenn hadn't seen before. Meanwhile, on the other side, we have Kubrick, the ever-famed, ever- -famed, ever a holic movie director who seems to be thinking he's going to be making Beethoven's Fifth. To his credit, Cooper can make a fantastic war movie, and even Glenn can attest to that one. Now, as the two men argue back and forth, it's time to decide who to go full on and scare the heck out of America with John or ease into the Kubrick. Scaring? No, no. Make it a masterpiece. The horror of the atom? Sounds. You want to be positive. You don't want to scare the crap out of them. At least not yet. Make them a masterpiece. Make it a horror movie out of what the enemies could do. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's what they would do. I don't know. We'll see. I don't want to scare the crap out of the American public. I want them to be positive, positive emotions so that they will want to have nuclear energy. Positivity. Aerial mining lane, not bad. <sighs> very good, very good. A little ahead of time. We're getting a lot of this research stuff done, haven't we? There you go, torpedoes. Totally need them right now. Torpedoes? Yeah. Torpedo reveal chance? Totally useful right now. Anything else down here? Oh, yes. Oh, crap. We can buy more uranium. This nuclear stock ball goes up. Oh, man. I don't know. Sabotage Chinese mines? Oh, God. I, I, if, I don't know if those options can fail, so that's why we're going to save. I'm a little worried that they will. So, let's sabotage Chinese mines, maybe? I'm not worried about the Japanese stockpile, I'll be honest. Like, they're not really worried. I'm not worried about them. Um, because I'll look at this at screen at the end, at the end too. How about nuclear nukes? Oh, we have more than them, though, but the glory of the atom. Hi there, I'm John Glenn, and I'm here to talk to you about a great nation's nuclear arm, and why nuclear weapons are our best defense against the enemies of our nation. It's important for every patriotic American to be well educated on this part of the critical part of our military and how, through our maintenance of a nuclear weapons program, we'll be able to prop up a brighter future for our world and all its people in it. There's a lot of misinformation that's been spreading around these weapons, and I've got some of the fine people defending your country to talk to you about what they are and how they work. Case. Chase cameras shooting film of our nuclear bombers, footage of a test launches from the White Sands, a submarine sailing from the ocean, all look great on the big screen. And with Disney's technical expertise, we've managed to put together a film that showed off America's powerful military. As personal reports of President Glenn indicate, that movie theaters across the country have slowed out in the wake of the second or the release of the film project. Across the country, veterans of the Second World War, children dragging their parents in, bands of teenagers both supportive and distrusting, and many, many more demographics all poured into the theater looking forward to the release of the film captured directly by the U.S. government. And as film reels rolled, audiences applause and cheers echoed across the halls of showcasings across the country. President Glenn walked, walks across the headlines of the American news outlets as the success of the film explodes in force. Sure, there are those few who would dare claim that the film promotes a military-industrial complex, but such naysayers are quickly just trampled by the sort of scores. A page is across the country praising the administration. Another fine day indeed. Told you that would work like that. Told you. And it did. Beautifully. I would do that. 100%. Great. Just don't ask about how, how many nukes we're buying and making. Just don't ask. We're making a lot. And we like them. We like them big. If they're not big, if they're not wide, if they're not lovely, we don't want them. Early warning system, Rajivik. To boldly make nuclear force a centerpiece of American strategy requires that we protect ourselves against any German or Japanese threat to uh, attempt to disarm or disrupt our nuclear arsenal. Early warning, where possible, surgical strikes must be the centerpiece of any such effort. I and ice in the closest old and territory to continental Europe, as ideally located for a host of facilities needed to achieve this objective. We'll draw plans to base o new over the horizon radars and hardened air bases in ice in the tip of the spear against the ice back in the German menace. Nice. Power of the gods. President Glenn strode along the broad spiral staircase that surrounded the new missile silo's main chamber. That catwalk was purely for inspecting the missile. Should anyone be in here when the rocket launched, or may God help their mortal soul? Regardless, bearing the start of the total nuclear war, no missiles would be launched, of course, today. Glenn. Sit admiring the massive cylindrical creation of aluminum and steel with the heart of plutonium. It was all inspiring. The power of God sitting right there before him with the judicious ability to wipe the face of the earth clean. However, unless pushed to the edge, America would never fire first. Uh, these purely for defense, of course. Insurance in the case the worst came to pass. He turned to the director of the new facility, a man named William Bauman. What's the range on this big old fat thing? Limited Man 3 claims the range of about 13,000 kilometers, he said, and that's roughly 8,000 miles, and farther than any other missile currently in service on this planet. Incredible, the president said, and they don't even know that we have it. Crowds and nips would be shaking in their boots if they knew that all the stuff we got up to. America needs a strong nuclear defense, and I'm glad my administration will help be able to help provide for it. Speak softly and carry a really large, heavy, thick stick. 
Uh, let's see. So we get a missile silo, 50 PP, some war support, uh, and production of nuclear weapons increased by 1%. What happens if we were to do this? Like, just... Holy sh... Nuggies! Okay, wow. Holy crap. Okay, so that just exploded everything. That last one we just did. What was it? Uh, our yield must grow. Power of gods. Our cost will increase. Okay, so that... Uh, we were doing so well with the economy. Uh, deficit. Jesus Christ. Other costs. Yeah, I guess that's supposed to be normal. I did see this on the Reddit, though. Like, oh, wow. Look at the reserves. It went really down. It needs to get more growth, but... Yeah, um... Nikes, Nikes, Nikes. Where would we do that? 773, 791, it barely goes up anymore. Um. Well, go big or go home, I guess. Well, I apologize, everybody, but now we're going to incur quite a debt. Don't ask about where all the money is going. Just don't ask. The less you know, the better everyone will be. And as long as people, the Americans love it, that's all that matters. I swear, sabotaging Chinese minds. No questions asked, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here comes the debt. I hate debt so much. I need to pay off my own debts, but still, whatever. No debt means I can buy more clothes. So I can actually look nice. Anyways. Oh, crap. Heightened suspicion. Uh, so I'm not going to do anything else. The race of tracks. We can, we can clear timer. Mm -hmm. Hopefully nothing happens. But Jesus Christ, that's a lot. That is an extreme amount. Where are we on for nuclear stuff? Set up a professional army. Um, social. I don't. I don't under social right. Equal rights or minorities? What? Generous subsidies. Max work hours. Military policies, political policies, defense ship torpedo. You know what? At, at this point, if we're gonna have such a debt, I mean, we're just gonna max out cost it for everything. I mean, there's nothing we can really do about it. Oh, we have 12, already almost 13 billion in debt. A letter from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mr. President, I received a letter from the Joint Chiefs of Staff today, and well, see for yourself, Secretary of Defense Cyrus Vance said, handing the several-page-long letter to John Glenn. Glenn took the letter and began to read, frowning as he did so. So they're angry that we're focusing on nukes, but isn't that what they wanted? But they're throwing a tantrum in the Pentagon because we aren't spending as much on everything else. Tanks, planes, aircraft carriers, basically the non-nuclear stuff, Secretary Vance sighed. You can just never make the children with stars on the shores happy, it seems. Give them nukes, they want tanks. Give them tanks, they want helicopters. And on and on it goes. <sighs> yeah, they have their own idea of what will win the next war and what won't, and that's different, that's different from the next guy, Glenn says, setting the letter down and rubbing his forehead, so they want a bit of everything. Secretary Vance nodded, but we can't do that. Congress would throw a conniption if we asked him for more money. Unless we take it from the NNC, but allow will the construction of new reactors. Glenn turned his big chair around and looked out the window towards the Rose Garden, contemplating its options. Ask Congress for more money, or for more funds to the military, which they won't like. Divert funding from the NNC, which would slow down the construction and development of new reactors or atomic projects. Or do the Joint Chiefs off, making them even grubbier than they already are. It's like days like these when Glenn wished he was still an astronaut. A bit more? We can trim a bit of nuclear program, I guess. The rate at which we construct nuclear weapons will be greatly reduced. Military profession will increase, though. A new military bill will be introduced to the Senate while two months pass it. The Republican Democrats are unlikely to stand for even more expenses being added to the Republican... I'll see if we can do that one. More money. More money. Um, More budget. And if we need more PP? Well, we got, we got a place to get PP. There you go. Don't really have to do it, but, you know, we might as well. Alright, so if that's a case. Because we have 54 Republicans. So we should do relatively okay. We still can't do unified stuff here, too, which I don't understand why. Why? Oh, crap. 39. That's not ideal. Four. Okay, so we can get a couple more Republicans here. Some room for further compromise. It only costs 10 PP. Democrats will try it. And then these guys as well. Oh, wow. Actually, 13 of the 36 enemies. Enemy centers. Those guys actually support us, huh? 22, 4. That's a lot, a lot of Republicans. All we need is get 11, right? All we need are 11. We can get enough of these guys. Who wants to spend what now? The phones outside the Oval Office were ringing constantly, even as staffers tried their best to keep them on top of them. The White House switchboard was overloaded. Telegrams and letters were pouring in, and frantic and frowsed officials were doing their best to read them and summarize contents. In general, President Glenn's proposed spending bill, the Augmented Defense Bill, or Act of 19... 
uh, 75 to give the military more money was not, of course, well received. Congressmen were rallying against the president on the floor of the Congress while senators were demanding face-to-face -face meetings to voice their displeasure. The few hawks in Congress were nearly totally sidelined. As Democrats, CNPP, which don't exist, and other enemies are working together to try to rein in a president that needs seem to be out of control. The president is asking the taxpayer to continue throwing their hard-earned dollars into the bottomless pit that is his vanity projects, space exploration to distant lands, nuclear reactors for every home, and now asking us to give Caladax to every soldier, one congressperson bellowed on the floor of the house. How will we pay for this? The taxpayers already blood dry. We already borrow way more than we should. We can print the money, but that will lead to hyperinflation, so the only answer is to stop. I'm all for giving our soldiers a means to protect America, and I'm in favor of building our nation's infrastructure. And to advance the frontiers of knowledge, a pro Glenn representative said in an op ed in the New York Times, but eventually you gotta be pragmatic and realistic, of course. We can't afford to bankrupt the nation to do so. Polls are already showing the president's approval is fall faltering, and the ever delicate coalition of Republicans and Democrats is fraying at the seams. It'll take a Herculean effort to get this new bill passed through Congress. Dan is just a number to the government, isn't it? Well crap. But at the same time, to land down under nuclear Iceland, yeah. The Hawaiian missile crisis appeared to be one thing above all else. The immediate presence of a nuclear threat has the potential to bring any power to the negotiating table. If a nation perceives that there is a new threat in their backyard, they will seek to address it, preferably without triggering doomsday. And fortunately, the U.S. is just the place for such a threat to be uh, established, Iceland. Across the archipelago bases that make up U.S. forces Iceland, we have already have a large number of nuclear-capable B-58s and B-52s ready to go at a moment's notice, of course, but by constructing new missile silos for the MRBMs and ICBMs, uh, a signal will be sent. Planes and crews may come and go, but silos are permanent. It would remind uh, Germania that we have the capacity uh, to strike fast and strike hard. Such a gamble would surely bring them to the table and halt their madness. And if they try anything, well, we'll be closer to them before... Uh, then, then we'll be closer to them ever than ever before. The augmented defense act succeeds. It was close, incredibly close, actually, 51 to 49. While President Glenn's augmented defense act actually passed with the vitriolic opposition from all sides, will be less on how to get the legislation through Congress for generations of political science students to come. The act promises hundreds of millions of dollars going to different projects, some of them on the cutting edge of technology that'll make decades to bear fruit. Uh, some will see the refitting and refurbishment of current vehicles to higher standards, and yet more to rebuild in the barracks and training grounds on the bases of the cross the U.S. Yet, the cost to pass a bill is much higher than the dollar value. To pass a bill, there were pork barrel projects galore shoved into appeal. And certain members of Congress, after all, who would vote against a massively bloated budget bill if that bill happened to have the money for a new bridge, hospital, highway, or for the district? The Republicans in Congress seem to have no restraint, gladly shoving billions of dollars into everything that the president wants and needs. Demo excuse me, Democrats are bolting the party. The president's approval ratings across the nation is cratering. The MPP has taken advantage, harping on the how the president's spending is going to tank the economy, building big and ridiculous monuments to his to his ego like the dictators of Europe. At the end of the day, with the favorability ratings dropping, the debt skyrocketing, and politicians of all stripes gunning for him, President Glenn can at least take some satisfaction in knowing that at least the military really appreciates the support and funding. I uh, sure hope you like your new toys, General. Better military professionals will increase military supervision, spend just a billion dollars, and then popularity among the military will rise, support among the civilians falls, and public support will go down. And, and quite literally, like, we had 51 to... 49, just because when you did this, we negotiated with Republicans. Actually, negotiated with Republicans, Democrats, and the far right. But the right, I decided against them. We only got one extra Democrat senator if we wanted them. We got 11-ish, was it 12-ish Republicans? So we had just enough Republicans. It's only the Republicans that voted for it, basically, in the end. So, But land on under. Australia, Liberty's last ocean in the Western Pacific, has lived under the constant threat of Japanese invasion for over 20 years. It's time that the extension of the OFN nuclear umbrella be made that much more tangible for our Aussie allies to provide them with the air bases and tactical missiles that will tip the scales in their favor against a nuclear, numerically superior Japanese adversary and nuclear submarine skunk works. The Pacific Ocean is vast and almost impossibly deep in areas, perfect cover for a new fleet of ballistic missile subs, waiting for the signal to deliver atomic retribution against a Japanese enemy, but the Japanese, with a presence from Hawaii to the former East Indies, will doubtlessly be vigilant against any intrusion by our silent service. But the underseas arms race is on, our subs must be engineered for victory. Also, I did max out all spending here too, so... Oh well. In the red, Pentagon announced billions in uranium contacts. Deficit revised further. The Wall Street Journal blared on its front page. President Glenn had seen the faces of RD senators and the Finance Committee grow pallid on TV as the NPP tortured the administration's lack of fiscal restraint. Sound the proverbial man in the street. Glenn's rocket ships ain't doing jack crap. It's not rocket ships, Glenn muttered. They're nuclear rocket ships. Secretary of the Treasury Jacob Javits coughed as he raised his hand. They've got a point, Mr. President. We revised the budget estimates three times over the last fiscal year, and there's not enough red ink in Washington. President Glenn pinched his nose. Stop. We've gone over this, and we're not out cutting the nuclear program. I'm trying to win the Cold War, for God's sake, and we're not doing that if we fall behind on the atomic curve. A vain twitch on Javits' face, leaving Vice President Gore to intercede. Honestly, John, do you really want to explain another budget correction to the Senate? The MPP is going to have a field day. The President Glenn drummed his fingers on the table, running the numbers. Research costs were open-ended. The weapons costs could come down, but only over time, left, that left will lean on the uranium mines.
Except for slight hits to our popularity in places that don't have nuclear reactors. Huh. <laughs> well, guess what? we got nuclear reactors in pretty much almost every state now, so it doesn't really matter too much. So, whatever. Papa Glenn thinks about every state. And about building a nuclear reactor in every state. Because everyone loves nuclear reactors. Only 300 billion in deficit. And 34 billion, or whatever. The debt to GDP ratio skyrocketed. It, it is what it is. But hey. I hope we get more satisfaction here. Actually, do this, do this, will. Yeah, I already maxed out earlier. Need to consume a good 787. Holy crap. That's a lot. Alright, okay, so I did this earlier. I did this like three times already. I want the Ares 2 project to succeed. So we're going to do it two more times so we can get to Mars. I still want to go to Mars. It's already December 1975. I don't think there's any other presidents in 1976 that we can elect. So that'll be good. Launch it. See, can we? Please. Ah, oh, we got it. Yes. Where are we at? 44%? 45. 45.5. Nice job, guys. 76%. Not bad. Increase project by a large amount. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's already 75. Can you get this one yet? No, that's 1980s stuff. Oh. oh, yeah, I'll get semi stealth modern bomber, tactical bombers. Oh, that's really cool. Alright, uh, what's going to happen now? High suspicion. Just purchase uh, Canadian uranium. I'd love to do a race of tracks, but it's not available, so. A game of chicken. That's not the price we discussed a week ago. You booty, Glenn roared in the headset. Tell me why the asking price for a pound of uranium doubled overnight. Mr. President, we're not trying to be unreasonable, the voice on the line replied neutrally in a languid drawl, but business, this is business, and I'll tell you right now, these price cuts you've requested can't be done immediately. None of that explains the price hikes. Get to the point, Glenn snapped. If you want us to work towards getting these costs down, then we're going to need larger mines and more modern refining techniques. The voice on the line chuckled, but without a hint of warmth, and with the budget deficits you've been printing, we figured you wouldn't be able to up for a federal joint venture. So instead of asking how we can figure this out, you're extorting the government. Real generous of you, Glenn replied venomously. The voice in the line hardened. You need us, Mr. President. You're swimming in the red, and we represent all the procedure of uranium in North America. You can't win. Don't bluff on our, our losing hand. You work for me now. We seize the uranium mines. All right, let's talk. Support future projects if nothing is done to adjust the cost. Um, now this, I re think I remembered reading about what we can do. You work for me. Now this is why we want a liberal a Supreme Court. I think it'll go for us. You work for me now. This isn't for national defense, so. We seize uranium mines. It's time to speak softly. Oh, we need the biggest... Oh, crap. We need the biggest nuclear arsenal. That's not good. The germs of Japanese must be made to understand that America is not high behind the moat of Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. American subs hide in the vast oceans, bringing nuclear annihilation to the very doorsteps of our enemies. And should the Japanese or Germans sweep the seas clean, they'll find American bombers and missiles waiting to strike beyond the range of their precious navies. If they want to reverse the tables and strike first, we will know beat them to the punch. America can and will win a nuclear war. The sooner Japan and Germany realize that, they will realize the fall of continuing their arms race and come to the tables to seek new accommodations. Uh, mission rewards. Oh, look at that. Nice. 92 research points, which means nothing. 27 public support. Great. Over the past several weeks, it's come to light that the U.S. government has been placing nuclear weapons in Australia, notably in the Northern Territory and Western Australia. Contrary to much of the American, what the American public, American public anticipated, the Australians seem to highly support the action, with the Australian Prime Minister claiming it makes both North America and Australia a safer place to be. A large minority of the uh, Australian population, however, have taken to the streets in protest believing they have by having American nuclear weapons on the soil, they are simply making their homeland a target. Back here in the States, however, the reaction has been de decidedly less cordial. In several major cities across the nation, thousands of protesters are calling for the removal of nuclear weapons from Australia. A rising star of the anti-nuclear movement, Randall Forsberg, had this to say, I don't believe that putting nuclear weapons in the country is helping anyone keep anyone safe. Not the Australians, not our government, not us. It all it achieves is pushing us one step closer to another Hawaiian missile crisis. Secretary of Defense Clark Clifford and Atomic Energy Commissioner Glenn Seaborg have dismissed such claims without further elaboration as of yet the President has not made himself available for comment on the situation. With all this trouble, one has to ask the question, how does this make the average American safer? Darn hippies. Hipperinos. Papa Hips, we need more money. What can we do with the research? I want to do something with the research, but we can't do anything with the research. That sucks. We see the uranium mines. I have determined, considering the overriding national security interests of the, of the nuclear program, that actions of certain private uranium uh, producers fall well outside of the public interest. Therefore, under the authority of the F Defense Production Act, the federal government will place certain uranium production and refining interests under public management with an immediate effect. The announcement, despite its undeniable phrasing, reverberated throughout Washington and uh, New York like a gunshot. 
The Dow Jones fell sharply as word spread that the Glenn administration would be soon be issuing administrative guidances to seize ownership of uranium mines throughout the country during a simple time of peace, no less. By mid-afternoon, the halls of Congress were in uproar as business lobbyists stormed receptive congressmen's offices, demanding an explanation for President Glenn's socialistic madness. The reaction varied amongst the mining companies that soon enough received notifications from the government informing them of their new management. A few broke ranks throughout the day, seeing an accommodation with the Glenn government that would at least keep the management in place. By evening, however, the majority of companies affected had gathered their legal counsel for a press conference in New York denouncing the administration's actions and vowing not to go down without a fight. They'll not go down quietly. Costs for maintaining expanded nuclear arsenals have decreased 10%. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Disquiet on the record. Uh, Republican Democratic Congressman and Senators had no single position with President Glenn's announcement that the federal government would be seizing uranium mines nationwide as the administration struggles to finance its burgeoning nuclear program. What voices could be heard in the Capitol were those of the RD Senators puzzled or openly critical of the administration's decision. The President has always been a dreamer. Uh, oh, no, I'm surprised that as any of you when I heard the president was going to be seizing private property. In this country, if you want something, you pay for it, right? That's not, that's, it's just not American. Commented one senator, refusing to be attributed. The president's always been a dreamer. Sometimes it leads him to reaching for the stars, and sometimes it leads him to falling flat on his booty when he realizes he's kicked in his own ladder out from under himself. A House Committee chairman related. And what I don't get is when does Glenn think he's going to go from go from for here? He's going to have to defend his move in the courts, or even if he wins over the Supreme Court. And how is this American industry ever going to trust him again? It's sad, really, limited a senior RD aide. Although the Republican Democratic Party leadership remained quiet on the president's unprecedented intervention in American business out of national security interests, the voice within the party should make it clear to the president that he does so well with an increasingly uneasy party at his back. They just don't like looking at the future, man. Why can't I make it more uni united? <laughs> And see, if I have to use consequence for this, that's fine with me. I don't care. I mean, how are we supposed to get the biggest arsenal? Well, it actually did reduce cost a little bit, but not by much. Because, how are we supposed to compete with the Germans? I guess we're supposed to be making more warheads every single month, but... We make 400 warheads. Okay, 362 warheads a month. That's not bad. Yeah, I'm going to have to use consequence for that one. Public support? Yeah. Not bad. Drone testing? Oh, yeah. The mining company filed suit. We strongly protest the administration's unprecedented actions on matter of private enterprise and make it clear that the plain life uh, plaintiffs, uh, my apologies, believe that the actions of the government represent a gross overreach of its constitutional powers that must be addressed immediately by the courts. The lead counsel of the mining companies declared open war between them and the Glenn administration before, and eager. <clears throat> Uh, press gallery, all salivating for the open se season to come in Washington. Let them take their best shot, President Glenn muttered, turning away from the TV in the Oval Office towards his assembled cabinet. The faces in the room were impassive. They made the peace with the possibility of a bruising legal fight the moment Glenn had decided he would seize the uranium mines. The Vice President Gore glanced around the room before responding, It's all or nothing, John. They've got the legal firepower to put up one heck of a fight, and they're already getting the interest of the Supreme Court. We might even go to oral arguments in a matter of days. Glenn nodded. There was no way back now. They'd have to burn the midnight oil with the lawyers to match the resources of the company. Now that the Supreme Court was involved, the odds of the nation would be upon them all. No pressure. And that's why I want the Supreme Court to be favorable towards us. Alright, high suspicions completed. Um, this is dangerous. We're going to put false flag attacks. Or actually, can we cripple the German ones? Let's see how much. I mean, we can't cripple like thousands of German nuclear warheads, but that'd be really cool. Decrease nuclear stockpile by a substantial amount. Yeah, doing the Japanese stuff is not worth it. Because they already have far less than us. They only have less than half of what we have. We're doing really well here. I should probably increase the stuff by more. Italy has one. Good job, Italy. Okay, so we can't do that one. Fortify the OFN. It's not a crisis, so... Um, I don't want to do the Saudi Arabia stuff because it's already out of reach for us, so... Um, you know what? If you want to read about the Saudi Arabian stuff... Or at least this one. Reach out to read it. Please go right ahead. The uranium case, mining bloodsuckers. A break rooms TV carried the leading story of the day as Jerome Bushwell, junior stockbroker, nursed his mug of coffee. Both the government and the uranium companies are preparing for a case that will decide what limits exist on the federal government's power over industry in the interest of national security. Did a no care for mining politics, Bushwell? He nearly jumped his boss. As, as his boss, veteran trader Abraham Abelworth slided into the break room. Oh, yeah, well... Was well, thinking of covering the metal sector eventually, you know. Bushwell laughed uneasily. Still, the government's got the right one on this one, boss. <clears throat> Abel scrutinized Bushwell for a moment, then sighed. My feelings aside, nationalization isn't something that's good for business. Well, yeah. But the government's trying to beat the Germans and Japanese by getting the nuclear business off the ground, right? And the companies were pushing it by threatening to raise prices through the roof. Can't imagine many people taking the company's side, Bushwell ventured. Boss, what you said? Is that the company line? 
Aborth carefully maintained a neutral expression as the TVs changed to stock footage of President Glam. Yeah, that's official line. Aborth poured himself a coffee and looked, took a seat opposite of Jerome. Personally, though, I don't buy a bit of it. The future won't come without breaking a few eggs. This should strengthen our case in the upcoming trial. Let's hope so. And hopefully we can just, just blow through Ares 3. Or at least Ares 4, so things can go relatively okay for us. But of course, now we just reach out to Riyadad, Ariad, and Oral Hearings. The courtroom of the Supreme Court of the United States of America was quickly, or was quiet as the justice walked in, save for a slight rustling of papers as both sides took a final look at their papers. With no press cameras allowed, the justice took their seats in dignified serenity. The justices motioned for the Solicitor General to speak, representing the administration. Justices, from requisitioning produce during the Revolutionary War to the control over the vital industries in the last World War, we must insist that the government has the customary power to intervene in private enterprise and the express service of national security in the present dangers of the Cold War. After the broad summary of historical precedent, the Solicitor General turned to the seat. The justices conferred briefly before motioning for the plaintiff to make the opening statement. The plaintiff's representative coughed gently. The government states that, he, that it has the power to seize private property for national security, but surely you recognize the slippery slope that this represents. Does the government intend to argue that the present moment, with no mass mobilization of men in arms, constitutes such a grave danger to the nation similar to that of the last war? Precedent cannot be enough to justify a grave and drastic action, and in the absence of precedent, I must also highlight the absence of any authorizing statute. We'll see where this goes. Oh boy. Uh, a lot of there. And if we're, of course, 32.8 billion, or a thousand warheads, I should say. A thousand warheads. And our man in Riyadh. If you're wondering about that one, please go right ahead. Ooh. Ooh, what's going to happen here? How long can they get your conjure money from the desert? Let's see. 32.8. 32.8. So nothing really changed here, did it? Operation success, that's good. Um, honestly, yeah, we're going to have to use cons commands here uh, to make sure that we get everything that we need to get done. So, that kind of sucks. I'll be honest, that kind of really does suck. But have I been using cons commands? I honestly can't remember if I've been using cons commands. Flag get checks. Just purchase some more stuff. That's fine for now. Anything up here? Nope. Let's see. Have I used cons commands? I've not. Decision. Oh, no, no. Focus. Focus dot no. No, no, no. No check. Checks. Yeah, there we go. Um, and we have to auto complete it just or we'll reset. So I apologize for having used cons commands for this one. We've already used cons commands in this campaign, but whatever. Just because for us to have the biggest arsenal, we should have started earlier, which we could have done maybe, but that would have taken so much more time and all the money. I don't know. Just if I knew about this earlier, we might have rushed down this. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. The Germans and Japanese must be made to understand, of course, this one. So if you want to do this again, please go right ahead. So let's take get rid of that because I'm not going to cheat to get this this one down. There, no, I'm going to do this you know, relatively legitly. So there's that one. It is what it is. But fortify the OFN. Even in negotiations between the superpowers, America is made stronger by the presence and support of its allies in the OFN. Their partners, not the feudal liege lords of German or the colonial kleptocracies of the Japanese, and even if they do not have the seat at the table, they deserve to be consulted and kept informed of where we seek to lead the OFN. At the ultimate goal of our nuclear diplomacy, if not peace in our time, then at least peace through strength. GDP growth goes up a little more higher, 0.5%, but ready the big stick. Just in case the Germans and Japanese saw all of our previous military posturing and development was a big dog and pony show, we'll make sure that we have a demonstration of the latest and greatest American military inventions and hardware. For all the world to see, it would be a terrible waste for this to actually ever be used, of course, and we're counting on the Germans and Japanese seeing it the same way we do. So, once again, I do apologize for having these cons commands, you know, just... How are we supposed to catch up? Like, at this point, like, it's, it's impossible to catch up. With, just because, you know, just because they have more warheads doesn't mean they're better. They might be really outdated. We're producing as, literally as many as we can. Also, we can do the nuclear triad, and we can launch a nuclear strike if we really wanted to to end the game, but uh, that's what I realized that these are these are keys. We have to do that one, and we go to war. Clearing the hurdles. The Supreme Court's judgment was in as now all the hard work would begin. Dozens of federal administrators were hastily assembled and they were repurposed offices in Washington, preparing to be dispatched uh, to the HQ and branch offices of the defeated mining companies across America. The federal government would have its way with the authority to organize and manage production of uranium across the United States, an expansion of national security powers now seen since the end of the Second World War. The business press naturally had cried foul. The Wall Street Journal editorial's page carried a feverish warning from the board, expansion of presidential authority, the latest surrender of American freedoms. Second best headline they've ever come up with after Glenn Wynn's presidency, Glenn remarked. Still can't quite believe he pulled it off, the Treasury Secretary Javits said. Or was all smiles? A rarity given its precautious portfolio only months ago. Now the mining companies will have to fall in line. They may have tried to stonewall us, but with the force of law on our side. Glenn laughed easily as he handed Javits the latest polling results from Gallup. A solid five point increase. Now with those figures, they won't. If they think that breaking the law now is going to help them, they can't do the worst. They can do the worst. Give it time or get left behind. Great victory for administration. Costs for maintaining and expanding our nuclear arsenal have gone down substantially. Public support will increase significantly and more growth. Oh, at least we get more growth. 
Almost half a trillion in GDP is not bad. Never mind, we're already past it now. Cool. You know what, we're gonna risk it. 57% is not good, but we'll see. Amount of mineral loss, well gosh dang it, that sucks. Seven second detections. Contingency planning and redundancies must be built into every strategy. What if the enemy overpowers our forward warning stations in Australia? And nice and by surprise. America cannot be left defenseless due to its reliance on forewarning from distant shores. We'll install a final set of early warning radios or radars. In Canada and Alaska, if we ever end up dependent on these systems, a window to retaliate will be minuscule, but it will be there. But a fragile piece. America now stands or maintains means to destroy its enemies a thousand times over. To take every nuclear weapon in their arsenal, match it, and then some. The quantitative and qualitative superiority of atomic arsenal has manifestly clear, and our enemies challenge it at their own peril. Whether nuclear superiority has an article of faith amongst the American public, surely we can afford to be magnanimous. Through the strategic arms limitations talks, we hope to convince superpowers to take a step back from the precipice of oblivion. We do not seek the adulation of Germany and Japan, only that their representatives come to the table as reasonable men. To promise the world that the sun will rise tomorrow, we can go daring a dream. Nice. Nuclear... Disarmament. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Hopefully we'll do well there, but no guarantees as we're doing the Ares program. Hopefully. One last time with 100% public approval. Just don't look at the debt. Mm, or deficit. Mm. But growth is not bad. Oh, look at that. We can spend even more on there. Oh, yeah. I'll spend more. Spend more. Nice. 8.299%. No, just 300 billion in deficit. That's all. That's all. That's not, that's not much. It's not much at all. Public support's over here. Oh, bueno, 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 bueno. Anything over here? Um, false flag, strike German. In. Yeah, why not? We'll continue strike German uh, nukes. They have 3,300. Or, I guess. Yeah, 3,300, huh? We have actually rapidly increased how many nukes we're making, which is nice and all, but like, once again, apologies for make, using console commands for that, but whatever. It is what it is. I, at this point, I don't really care. Yeah, we can nuke, we can nuke them if we want. Burgundy stopped making nukes, which is kind of weird. Is Burgundy doing okay? What's going on with Burgundy? No, they're still, they're still alive, so they didn't capitulate to each other, or to itself. Something like that. But we're still making uh, more enrichment plants. Base war production, plus 20 a month. Not enough. Not enough. But happy July, everybody. We're halfway through 1976. So that's one of the longest campaigns I've actually done before. I think yeah, another one long was, was it Spear or was it Borman? I can't remember. Another one was quite long as well, but... Nuclear disarmament negotiations for decades since man first split the atom. The great powers of the world have been amassing ever-increasing stockpiles of nuclear warheads. These warheads could end the world several times over, and yet they presently sit idle in missile silos, hangar aircrafts, or aircraft hangars, and submarines. As the new anti-ballistic missile technology develops, the cost of modernizing our stockpiles and reacting to new developments begins exponentially exponentially multiplying. President Glenn knows that we have no choice but to live either in peace, die in pieces, or go bankrupt as our stockpile increases. He knows his choice, but it'll be meaningless unless Germany and Japan sign on. Let's set a time and place for all three superpowers to sit down and discuss de-escalation and present an argument for everyone stepping back from the brink, and hope that Germany and Japan can see the reason. There will be many issues that could complicate the talk, such as a deterrence argument. Here's about Italy and India's nuclear ambitions and Burgundy's. The security of the sphere in the Russians front and the Japanese sphere's successful U.S. invasion. We'll have to be prepared to respond to all these concerns should we hope to end this role threatening Max Mexican send-off once and for all. I'll just like to adventure. Security interests. Guess for the king. Hmm. And for the kill. Victims of war. Call out the palace. Send in the spooks. What's our beginning? Uh, you know what? If you want to rebuild this one, please go right ahead. We'll go with that one. You know what, if you just want to read through all these, please go ahead as well. Guess for the King, Operation Sandstorm, Stepping Up the Shipments, Finding Their Leaders, Pick Thy Targets, Black Gold Rush, and In for the Kill. It's time for choosing. It goes without saying that the talk should be held on neutral ground. Italy and India are rising stars that are obviously off the limits as well. Our negotiation team has narrowed down the possible locations of three viable options, Buenos Aires, Istanbul, and Lhasa. Buenos Aires is closest to us and is a sunny and welcoming city. With one of the highest qualities of life in Latin America, beautiful architecture and vibrant culture, it could be a relaxing destination where all parties can feel at ease. Plus, we Argentine beer is or beef is almost as good as Kobe beef. Istanbul is closest to Germany and is truly a historic tale. Hagia Sophia dominates the landscape and over 1500 years of history surrounds you as you gaze across the Bosphorus. A nice Turkish coffee may warm the hearts of our negotiating partners. Laos is closest to Japan and is the ancient capital of Tibet. It is one of the highest elevated cities on earth and is beautifully nestled in the Nechen Tahiga Mountains. Poltala Palace could be the perfect venue for our talks, and perhaps the serenity and tranquility of the local Buddhist monks could set the negotiators on the path of peace, which city hosts the talks. I like Buenos Aires. Let's go there. In the Americas. 8% growth, not enough, but hey, at least GDP is skyrocketing, even though quite less than this, but whatever. 
Temp tax cut. Uh, bigger deficit. Uh, I'm not gonna deal with that. But six days left. Also, I did use console commands to get the the what the Gemini Mark II suits done. So just to get it done. I mean, there's no reason why it should be glitched out. So, okay, buy more stuff. How many nuclear? How many nukes do the, the Germans have? Thirty-three point two thousand. Twenty-one point two thousand. Yeah, we're definitely catching up to them. But whatever. Global coverage. We would have a lot of strategic bombers, which does suck for us. But you know, whatever. I guess we get a oh goodbye. We do have what intercontinental ballistic missiles. We'll put two hundred there. In Australia, we'll put in. Uh, there you go. Maybe some tack strap bombers because we do have some strap bombers as well. Kind of play the game here. Uh, right there. There you go. Smoke on the wind. Bruce Lingen. Uh, rest, sat resting his hand on his palm, reading and rereading the community key from Washington. He'd been ensconced in the American embassy for days, drafting policy plans in the scarring heat, sealing fans going full force, a full bore. They often revolt, evolve so fast he was half afraid they'd spin off their axis and decapitate him. Frankly, now he'd received his orders, but he was almost starting to hope for it. With a sigh, he called in Agent Hunt, one of the latest concrete cowboys Langley had sent him. Like most agency men in the field, Hunt was a red-blooded American with a taste for beer, football, and shooting foreigners. Bruce had an almost instantaneous dislike for the man, but if they were going to be forced to work together, they may as well try and be civil. After all personality conflicts aside, they were striving for the same goal. Bruce lit a cigarette and offered the one to the Hunt that he tossed community key over to Hunt's side of the desk. The Prans decided to put boots on the ground, he said laconically, in a carefully neutral tone of voice. He'd become paranoid lately that his office might be bugged either by the Saudis or the agency, but did not want to give them any education that he was doubting the efficacy of the slowly escalating policy of interventionism in the Middle East. Han glanced over the document and flicked his eyes to Bruce's. Well, we'd better get rid of them, is what you're saying, he said, a barely perceptible grin on his face. Bruce nodded. Get, get, get everyone organized. The first of them are going to be here pretty darn soon, and we're nowhere near ready to receive them. And for God's sakes, get Frank... To keep the size off my darn back. Hunt stood <clears throat> and flashed Bruce a pearly white smile as he made for the door. Hot darn, it's going to be just like another South Africa. The overture begins, and 67% is not great. The but making of history. The Germans and Japanese have seen reason and agree to negotiate. The delegates are already on their way to Buenos Aires and are men are packing their bags too. This is already a good sign for the future of these talks, and given that we have the largest nuclear arsenal, supposedly, we're poised to provide key leadership in the negotiations. The ball is now in our court, and all that remains once we get to the table in Buenos Aires is to make them their first move. And on. To Buenos Aires. Fingers crossed. I don't think I've ever seen the AI do that. So yeah, we're not doing launch areas first. We're going to run diagnostic simulations first, and then maybe we'll see what happens so we can head for the moon. Uh, so how many how many words are we making about? 410? Not enough. Not enough. We need more. More. There's never enough warheads in the world, man. Just never enough. Especially on our side, but really, Japan's not doing too much here. Gifts for the king, though. Very nice. And we're going to do Operation Sandstorm. Why not? Because we can. Presenting our argument. Everyone has arrived in Buenos Aires. The Germans look fresh and ready for anything. The Japanese look hesitant, somewhat unsure of our intentions. At least they can all rest assured that as the largest nuclear power, we have the most uh, s sacrifice of these talks. There are two main options for opening argument to sell the former Axis on disarmament. The first argument is one of pure pragmatism. Our nuclear stockpiles are putting us all in the red. If we all agree we don't launch first strikes, then cutting the cost of our atomic arsenal should be a no-brainer. This argument will prioritize cutting spending on ABM systems and limiting our ICBM stockpiles. This is a more realistic goal and will preserve our, our, per, yeah, our advantage in the missile gap, but will only achieve very limited spending reductions in disarmament. The second is more moral and idealistic. We'll tell the nations point blank that we cannot let a war between the nations and the human race. We're on the brink of destruction and we all need to step the heck back for a good of mankind. This will lead to massive disarmament and equally massive savings if it works. If not, we may as well walk away from with nothing. Japan is particularly afraid of us launching an invasion if there's no nuclear deterrent to stop us. Well, of course, both options shall allow for opportunities to compromise. Which I would choose? The moral option? Pragmatic. Pragmatism? I don't like the one. I like the moral option. That sounds really cool. We can flaunt. Oh, we're being so moral here. Hopefully they agree, because if not, we'll have to go back in time. Again. But we're going to strike at the German uranium facilities. Because that can only go well for us, right? Only can go well. Oh, 422 now. Not bad. Not enough. Not enough. We have unlimited power with nuclear power. Unlimited. More. I demand more. How much money do we have here, actually? We have 86% approval rating, which is super high. And super nice. Super, super nice. Cool. And one day's left. Oh, boy. You know what? 82%. You know, I just saved. I'm not going to save it again. Let's see. Please tell me it's going to work. Operate success. Throwing Dancing Monk Stars. There we go, my friends. Four down to heaven. Ooh, don't have to save that one again. Where are we at? 44.5%. Not bad. Screw with all that stuff. Can we do that one yet? We have gone where no man has gone before. Well, let's see what happens next. 
Oh, uh, going to battle. Let's go ahead as well. Boom. And we need to get the rocket back as well. So that'll be good. Launch of Ares 4. Did, oh, this is an question. We've set the bar high for these talks with a near total disarmament proposal. Now it's time to talk about the specifics. What future will the intercontinental ballistic missiles have in our militaries? If President Glenn gets his way, they shall have no future whatsoever. If the ICBM launch buttons are ever pressed, then they have failed in their purpose. No nation ever wants to use ICBMs in war, so it's time to ban their construction and limit their stockpile. President Glenn. We'll propose a ban on all ICBM construction and a limit of no more than 25 missiles per nation. Must be enough for a token arsenal while being too low to cause human extinction where all to be fired. We shall send this detailed offer to the other parties and await their response. Gotta aim high to win big in the launch of Ares 4. Today was a big day. The big day. The beginning of NASA's next golden age. Starting at a 30 minutes of countdown, every TV set in the U.S. was tuned in to see the launch of Ares 4, one of the biggest projects in NASA history. The rocket is expected to land on Mars once it takes off into the stratosphere. Have 15 minutes of launch, the American public watches with bated breath, not knowing whether the launch would fail or succeed. Only 10 will tell astronauts on board wait for the final countdown. In a matter of moments, the rocket boosters ignite, and with well over a few million Americans tuned in, Ares 4 takes off from the launch pad. The launch is a great success. As the rocket eventually fades into the darkness of space, Americans from coast to coast all rejoice at the Space Administration's historic accomplishment. Even though NASA be officials believe it will take 270 days before Ares 4 has made its Mars landing, American patriotism soars as the country now has its own horse in the space exploration race. President Glenn attends a huge celebration at the White House with members of NASA, but the calmness of the lonely air draws him outside as the night continues. Glenn is content with staring up at the stars as he muses on the successful flight alone. The President looks up at Mars and smiles, his champagne glass, held out as if he is asking the constellations to dine with him. Mission complete. If only if we could have seen it. Nice. Anything else here? The rocket stats, of course. Um, Silent Majority speaks. We could have hardly expected our deployment of ground troops to Saudi Arabia to remain covert for long, and since it's gone public, we've begun indonated with opposition to our escalation of American presence in the Middle East. Students in South Africa, veterans have staged anti-war demonstrations in several universities and parks across America, and they've made public their plans to march on Washington and call for a halt in deployment, which we're not over there anyways. Senators from both sides of the party divided are being buried in angry letters from constituents. Many of them have had family who died in Africa and consequently are urgently calling in Congress for a freeze in troop deployments or with more radical senators a total withdrawal. We lose serious face in the international community if we just pull down. We just can't abandon the Saudis. Slimy dudes, though they may be. Without jeopardizing our oil supply, all we can do is hope tensions don't escalate and we get stuck in a war we can't win. Gosh darn it all, why does such an oil-rich region have to be so unstable? The last thing we need is to get caught in another quagmire. Look at all this upgrading stuff. Oh, so nice. Secondary schooling with tertiary schooling. Nice. And improving the industry as well. What's not to love? <sighs> not bad. Just 54.4%. At least we have unlimited debt ceiling, which is nice. How much debt servicing do we have? We have almost nothing for now. Once it gets bad enough. Oh, uh, it's alright. We don't need to think about it. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Let the next generation pay for it. Full ICBM disarmament achieved. Wow. Look at that. Miraculously, we have somewhat convinced the superpowers to agree to a near-total ICBM disarmament. After this treaty is signed and implemented, there will be only 75 ICBM warheads left functioning in the world, nowhere near enough to cause human extinction alone, for now. Well, the world is stunned by the incredible victory we've won today. No one expected a result as profound as we have achieved. The world's nuclear stockpiles will plummet, and the doctrine of GMAT is on its way to being a footnote of history. Most importantly, NASA will be able to fund itself till Kingdom Come with the amount of money we'll save. Glenn's going to be a gosh darn hero to the world after this. The final item on the agenda is the protocol for the SLBM Limitation Treaty. Let's hope this goes just as smoothly. Walker's note is getting reworked to lock B way less total. Clock spurns away from midnight. German-American tensions decreased by 15% for total tension of 5%. Japanese-American tensions decreased by 15% for total negative 5 So we have no tension between us and Japan. Stockpile of three nations will be significantly reduced. Okay. 500, 500, 500. Mission rewards. Look at that. Nice. Awesome. Um, 500, 500, 500. Monthly war production, one. Wow. So, what else can we do here? Nothing else, really. I'll do this one. I'll do this. Uh, test the rocket. Ooh. We can do that one. Black gold rush? Sure, why not? Because we have to wait 270 days for that one, so we got to keep doing this stuff for now. Can you find some CIA? Why not? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it's this one. Yeah. The Ares 4 hurdles through the vast empty expanse of space. The vessel and its crew capture the attention of an entire nation. Nay, a whole world. A mission to Mars or a planet, a distant dream of science fiction writers and spacefaring enthusiasts seems finally within reach. The months long mission to Terra's dis distant cousin will be arduous and taxing, stretching man and machine to the very limit, but they carry with them the hopes and dreams of an entire generation, eager to see once distant hopes made manifest. Prospera ad astra through hardships to the stars. Tertiary schooling, nice. 
Right. 100%. Oh, that's so nice. Increase the budget, though. More budget, please. Thank you very much. And when in doubt, increase consumer goods. Yes. There you go. When you have enough, of course. Assassin strikes the president. Early this morning, as President Glenn was briefing the press on the progress of the negotiations, a small man in the gray coat launched forward from the crowd of reporters brandishing a small pistol and fired the president. Miraculously, the bullets merely grazed President Glenn's coat, and the assailant was swiftly tackled by nearby reporters and hauled away for questioning by the Secret Service. The president was swiftly rushed to safety, and the building was placed on lockdown. The man in custody promised to immediately write out a confession of his entire plot and asked for his pen and piece of paper. Unfortunately, when he gave him his pen after he was frisked, he immediately bit down on the nib. The man was dead before his body hit the floor, apparently a cause of in ten ten intentional po cyanide poisoning. The man has been identified as Mr. Ernst Gottlieb, a native of the German Reich. While he had pa press credentials, he was also in possession of documents indicating he was an intelligence officer within the, within the Wehrmacht. We sent an urgent response or request to Germany for an explanation, and the talks have been frozen until a decision can be made. What the heck is going on? Nothing. We're suppressing the far right. Or I should just call them the right for now. We'll see what they end up being. Lingley and the Saudi. If you want to about that one, please go right ahead. I'm not too interested in the whole Saudi thing right now, just because we got bigger things to do right now, don't we? Germany blames Burgundy. After an hour, Germany has responded to an ultimatum demanding an explanation. They claim that Mr. Gottlieb's military papers are clever forgeries. While we've been asked to keep this information confidential, they've informed us that the man is almost certainly a member of the Heinrich Himmler's Burgundian SS attempting to sabotage the Buenos Aires talks. They've informed us that while Burgundy remains the jure part of the Reich, it has been de facto independent ever since the outbreak of the German Civil War. And so that Himmler has seen as a traitor to Germany ever since his failed putsch and that he is a top enemy of the Fuhrer. While they're not entirely sure why Burgundy would want to sabotage uh, the disarmament talks, they suspect that Burgundy has staged a false flag attack to damage Germany's international reputation and so chaos within the German government in anticipation of a second Himmlerite push. These claims about Burgundy smack of a conspiracy theory, one which has little evidence other than the Nazis' word, yet it is also unclear why Germany would want to assassinate the president. The fact that the three powers have reached an initial agreement would suggest Germany is interested in disarmament. And doesn't it seem crazy that Germany would agree to a partial disarmament, then assassinate the president of the US, then Himmler would try to sabotage these talks? The choice is yours, Mr. President. Should we trust Germany and carry on with the talks, or pull out now in case something else worse awaits us on the road? They shall continue. We're going home. How much is this going up? Because I don't want to hurt that too much. Honestly, at this point, deficit's not bad. 4%. Um, what do we do with tax hike? We get 1% lower growth. We get a little bit of surplus. 1% less growth, which obviously a god-awful thing. But we get surplus because we're cutting down the debt. The talks continue. Following that all foreign attempts at sabotage would never stand in the path of peace, President Glenn proudly announced that the Buenos Aires talks were a zoom of added security. President Glenn is confident that Germany had nothing to do with an attempt on his life, and Japan and Germany both expressed willingness to discuss further disarmament. The, word, uh, the world has breathed a sigh of relief after holding their breath in the wake of the assassination attempt. While no one uh, has officially been blamed for the attack yet, some inside sources speaking on condition of anonymity are suggesting that intense intelligence security is currently being placed on the Burgundian Order State. In any case, it appears that the police has prevailed through terrible adversity. The clock retreats further from midnight. Try to kill him and he'll say, nah, nah, we're okay. At this point, close out of the CIA, I don't want to see that anymore. Oh, we're still going to try to sabotage Germany's stuff. Oh, we're 506, 503, 500. That's the LBM question. After signing the ICBM question, or treaty, limitation treaty, it's time to move up to the last item on our agenda, submarine launch ballistic missiles. While SLBMs are cheaper to maintain than ICBMs, they're still dangerous and an expensive pain in the butt. Something needs to be done about these missiles. Our negotiating team has come up with two proposals. Converting nuclear armed subs to conventional subs who scrapping the boats and the warheads together. The second has greater advantage potential, savings potential. But the first may be an easier pill for the other power pill powers to swallow. It may be best not to push our luck, but we could compromise if we get pushed back on scrapping the boats. What should our position be? Scrap the boats. Or a bunch of boat scrappers. Pick your targets, my friend. Pick your targets. Okay, four points of pursuit. That's not bad. While we did have a slight little tax hike, we are ma still maxed out on social spending, admin spending, science spending, admin, or army, naval, and nuclear spending as well. The first rejection. Ooh, no way, Jose. If you learned about that, please go right ahead. The first rejection. The Japanese delegation reacted coolly to our SLBM limitation proposal. In particular, they objected to the reduction in their naval power that would come from scrapping so many subs. They demand that we in turn scrap a significant number of destroyers for the same of naval par parity. Their objection would put a major dent in our navy and cause some controversy at home. At the same time, we don't really plan on a war. Maybe this compromise is a blessing in disguise. Less than money destroyers means more money to spend on NASA. We may lose faith if we agree to this compromise, yet it may also be the way, only way to get the Japs to move on with the negotiations, which I'll be. No way, Jose. Unfortunately, I tried this like six different times off screen, and, well, it just never worked out for us, so 
Destroy ten destroyers. They're only ten destroyers. That's fine. No issues with that. So apologize for that. A couple of destroyers go bye bye. We're still picking our targets here as we're waiting for the Mars landing to get done, of course. And let's finish this thing. And we're also doing the Daily Dose project, program, the fate of the warheads. Jupiter and Japan have both agreed to a reduction in SLBMs, but what shall be the fate of our warheads? Two options present themselves to us. We could allow the warheads to remain operational since the range is too limited to be a serious threat to the superpowers. Alternatively, in the true spirit of disarmament, we have the we could have the warheads completely scrapped. The parties would be more likely to achieve or to agree to scrapping them as it would be more fair. This is all in bigger savings and less danger to the world, but we need to need have a need for medium range missiles. We could try and push or retain them. Try carefully as the powers may not see the point of such a proposal. Scrap them. What are they going to say? I'm going to say pick your targets. Step up shipments? Why not? Because we can. Rocket status? 87%. Oh, and we did do this one really well. We did succeed in this one, so. Just to get that one done. Just because we could. Just because we could. We can't do this one for some reason, which is weird, but whatever. Mission rewards? Nice. Ares, Diana, Minerva... Doesn't really matter. I don't think we did the arrows one yet. Did we? Yeah, we did. Let me nerve again. We have left off. After lengthy negotiations, both Germany and Japan have agreed to our SLBM proposal. The second and last major treaty of the Buenos Aires talks have been signed today, and we can say with confidence that these talks were conclusively successful. With the conference wrapped up, we can return home proud of our accomplishments. NASA will rejoice from the major funding boost, and the world will breathe a sigh of relief that they have a lot less fear to cause. A cause of fear, a war between the superpowers. President Glenn returns America's superhero. And the press are already raving about his diplomatic mastery. There's so much to fear from rising nuclear powers such as Italy and Burgundy, but at least now the big three are on the path to peace. A great day for the world. Slightly reduce the number of nuclear stockpiles and expenses of the three nations. Slightly. Slightly. We still have 180 days left, so economy-wise, that's not bad. Cold War-wise, oh wow, we're down to 300, 300, 300 some. We're still doing really well. They have 153. Overall, not bad. We can make one a month. They're making one a month. Well, at this point, I might as well show you pretty much everything here in terms of score. It's not going to change that much, especially once we land on Mars. But it'll balloon up once we get to Mars. But here is a Cold War score. Let's go by rankings. We are top dog. No doubt about it. When these come by a score, they're below us. So, which is very, very good. And in for the kill. But back here. Uh, let's see. Military 628. The Japanese have the biggest military. Econ economically speaking, we are like triple the other two. Occupation of San Marco Square. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. Uh, victory is 580. Victory is negative 280. Victory is negative 300. Faction 430. Almost 1500 in terms of score in terms of faction. 708 for the Japanese. Uh, we five, oh, no. We're going to continue. We're not done yet. We ain't done yet. We're going to go to Mars, son. Even though we should have, shouldn't be in office. But technically, we can still run for a third term. Uh, sock dev, technology, stability, GDP per capita, national debt sucks. Poverty rate kind of sucks. Diplomacy. We have 16 members for the Japanese. This is uh, also this is a Japanese one that we're currently uh, on right now. So, um, economic score 16. So, and this is their score. Now the German Reich. Oh my God! Total defeat in South Africa and the oil crisis and the Malagasy civil war. In for the kill, though, my friends. And they did do the moon landing, of course. So this is them. This is their score. And total achievements. Total score negative 300. These guys have t total of negative 290. And our score is 580. Army size 72. Arm Navy size 414. Stockpile 5, Army Professionals 137, 39 members in our sphere is actually really nice. Very, very nice. Anything else we can do here? Oh, we can test the rocket. Here. I have 15%. I don't know, it doesn't matter. 136 days left, so. Uh, let's keep looking at the score, though. So for us, we have a total victory in South Africa. We have vic victory in the oil crisis, Philippine landing, Malaya insurgency, Malagasy civil war. Overall, we did really well. Tensions. There's very little tension between us and Germany. There's a, quite a bit of tension between the Germans and the Japanese. And we have no tension with the Japanese. They love us. They absolutely love us. Nuclear disarmament talks succeed. Annual decay. And nuclear disarmament talks succeed. So, overall, not too concerning, right? And happy February now. And then we have the spheres, of course. We have 39. They have 16. They have 14. I have a cup of coffee. Or 37% of global GDP. 23%. Look at the G total sphere GDP. 861 billion. Followed up by the UK. And then the... Is that Canada? I thought it was India. Canada. And then the Union of South Africa. Then Australia. That's not bad. Angola has a bigger GDP than the Spanish Republic. That's pretty darn sad. Not gonna lie. There's all these guys down here. A lot of little states. And then Japan obviously has the biggest. Followed by China. Followed by... Who is this? Guangdong. And some other states as well. 
My apologies, my cat wanted to be left out of the room. And then Azan Hind, um, Siam or Thailand, Guangxi Clique, and of course Germany's big, which if they went with a the spare, they would have gone even bigger. French states, not that big, it's actually really small and tiny, so that's really sad. Sweden, Finland, Romania, and then, or I'm sorry, Muscovine, and then of course we did see nukes over here as well earlier, in which we're doing quite alright. Okay, it's still launch a nuclear war, but I think we'll be okay. Well, my friends, it's June 3rd, 1977, and I think we're out about now. We've got something coming online. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. The dream fulfilled. The result of a journey that lasted months would now be considered in eight minutes. Mission Control was silent. Where it had been a hub of fervent activity just moments ago, they had completed their task. The result was in the hands of the astronauts. In just eight minutes, the world would know if Ares 4 would be a tremendous victory or a terrible tragedy. Sometimes, the most defining part of a person's life lasts only a few moments. Neil Armstrong, commander of the Ares 4, knew full well what these would be the most important moments of his life. Parachutes deployed. David Cross continued to monitor the lander's altitude. Armstrong's hand trembled as he engaged a decisive retro rockets and prepared for final approach despite the furious shaking of the cabin. Both men took a moment to take in the view. The Melas Chasma had a quiet beauty to it, a landscape of deep grooves and red sand. We're really here, aren't we? Cross posed. Not moving his hands an inch from the control panel, we really are. Armstrong affirmed his grip on the joystick and took him in. Neil Armstrong descended from the ladder and became the first human to step foot onto a new world. From our earliest days, mankind has looked up and dreamed of walking among the stars. Today, that dream has been fulfilled. After this, the streets had erupted into beautiful chaos. Traffic halted as people crowded the roads. Firework detonations had become near constant. The moon landing had ensured America's spot within the space race. Landing on Mars had reinvigorated the American spirit. The future was finally looking bright. From within NASA's mission control, John Glenn stood. Cheers erupted as the landing was confirmed. Glenn watched the man on Mars smile and began to cry. President Glenn's mood matched the nations as he sat behind his desk. Glenn smiled as the address started. To the many people of the world, to my fellow Americans today, we've achieved the impossible one st small step for man. Wow, look at all that stuff. The stars are ours of the conquered frontier. America, America, society grows a little more unified and GDP growth increased by 3.5%. We've made it. The Earth is the cradle of humanity, but man cannot kind of stay in the cradle forever. The journey begins, my friends, and oh, actually, oh, there's one more. Oh yeah, there's three, three day focus. The Eagles landed. We have dared to attempt the impossible, and now, thanks to the tireless work of by NASA and the Glenn administration, we have done it. For the first time in human history, the man has stepped up off the, upon the surface of another world and returned safely to our soil. The nation has effectively shut down, with riotous celebrations held across the country in a ticker tape parade held for the crew of the Aries Four in New York City. Calls and congratulations have come from the leaders across the world, including everyone from our allies in the OFN to the Prime Minister of Japan. The flight crew have described themselves as the happiest men on the planet. But the White House staff knows better. The happiest man in the world sits in the Oval Office, half listening to the terse congratulations of the Fuhrer, basking in America's greatest triumph of the century. Daring to dream of the new dawn, my friends. The eagle has landed. Ten days out of three, nice. Now, is that it for John Glenn? That should be it, right? We don't have anything here at the end saying, that. oh, and that's the end of all the content for America. And it's already 1977. My God, we failed the Mars landing, apparently. But we did it, everyone. We did it. Oh, we can also launch Minerva 4 again, I guess. Awesome. Mission rewards. Don't really need more mission rewards, but you know what? Let's have false flag attacks on Japanese shipments, but that's going to be it for us. Now, at this point, we're cutting down the debt. We have a surplus. I did do a temp tax hike. We're spending like crazy, but we got 8% growth. So, overall, I love I love John Glenn's campaign so much. I hope you guys do as well, because it's just so much fun. It hasn't changed really that much at all since it first came out. Eventually, it's going to hopefully get a little rework, a little more interesting, more things to do. Um, just getting NASA involved. I wish, even in real life, we were... Maybe we still are, but I don't know. Going to Mars would be a lot of fun. I know we're working on that in real life, but like... How fast, how far, how how much are we really devoted toward that? But anyways, if you enjoyed the campaign and me spending about two to three hours actually on this video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I will see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching and have a great, 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 great Glenn rest of your day.